In this series, a lot of people have seen or have assumed that I'm essentially turning the universe into a gigantic riddle, existence itself into just some massive unknown. Um, and those who have sort of, in a sort of qualified way, um, agreed with me, have said, okay, we know, we've already, we already know that, so this is now no longer a useful thing to contemplate, so let's just move on from there. Um, we know that the universe is just sort of an unknown. We know that existence is an unknown. However, that, you know, shouldn't stop us from doing all kinds of other stuff. And I agree. Um, <clears throat> others have sort of said, okay, I see where you're going with this, uh, or at least I see how you've gone with your uh, epistemology. <clears throat> what do you believe? <laughs> where are you going with this? That's why people, I, these sorts of people, I think, are just sort of saying that I am making a case for solipsism, which I am constantly mystified by because I, I, I'm not. I, I don't think that I'm doing any such thing. Um, well, <laughs> my beliefs, I guess you would call them non-beliefs, or uh, you, can, you can reduce um, things to a certain point beyond which it's impossible to really talk about them. Um, so, you know, again, I, I'm going to explain a few things that I don't really believe in, but that mean something to me, and I'll just let people see what they get out of it. The idea of awe, the word A-W-E, the word wow, um, that's a pretty potent word for me. The idea of numinosity, that which is numinous, that which sort of causes your heart to skip a beat, causes your um, your sense of reality to become sublime, Zopfe's sublimation, uh, Schopenhauer's aesthetic uh, contemplation, the idea of just standing there in awe of everything. <clears throat> Maybe not even the in awe of anything, you're just in awe. I have experienced that feeling in little snippets, short snippets, but unmistakable ones. I understand the chemical, um, biological, neurological uh, component of all of this, don't get me wrong. But, as I said in my other comments on experiences, uh, on experience, on qualia, things like that, I can't reject one experience and accept another one because they're both essentially coming from the same place. Any experience I ever have of anything is coming from the same place. Um, if I reject the experience of Wow, that is beautiful. Wow. Um, then I have to reject the experience of, um, I don't know, physics? Because <laughs> that's equally problematic. That's equally um, illusory when you get right down to it. So I tend to accept, or in as much as I'm capable of doing it, I tend to accept both as equally real, I guess, or uh, provisionally real. I don't really see science as something that I care to debunk or disprove or that, that I want to say it doesn't exist or anything. And I treat experience the same way. In fact, as I say, the two of them are uh, interlinked. So, I have to say that they're equally real, at least in the way that I've put this epistemology together in my mind. Happiness is a real thing. Happiness exists. Misery exists. I know that. The depths of depression exists. There is a place where you feel so horrible you simply don't believe you can feel any worse, so your capacity to feel anything shuts down. Uh, and that's probably hell on earth. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there are worse ways to feel. I'm not in a position to say. <clears throat> However, um, there's also the feeling of oh. 
you just you can't believe that things are so fabulous. Um, and I don't mean things; I mean just this space that you're in. Um, what's an example of something that provokes that in me? Well, music that does that for a lot of people. A certain type of music, and everyone is different in that regard. Uh, poetry, getting lost in reverie of poetry. Um, that has that effect. Now, somebody can study my body and my brain and everything and watch what happens, but they can't fundamentally explain the experience of it because they can't see it. It's not, it's not something that anyone can study. Um, I can snort cocaine and all kinds of interesting things will happen in my body chemistry, my brain chemistry and this sort of thing, and we can say this is what's happened. Well, something else has happened. I got really high. I actually experienced something. Um, and I don't think science is ever going to... Well, I shouldn't say that, never say never, but I can't imagine a, cir a circumstance under which we can explain what that experience is. Why did I feel so fabulous? Why do these feelings feel fabulous? What makes the, the, the high of a drug fabulous. Now, I brought drugs into this deliberately simply because the search for the numinous is also a very dangerous path. Uh, it can lead you to make terrible mistakes. First of all, the search for the numinous places a sort of reality or uh, sort of, as I say, conditional or provisional reality onto things like <laughs> the depths of depression. That's real. Primal horror is real. <laughs> Um, not uh, not a nice thing to contemplate when you think about it, and I think that a lot of people who are drawn towards completely stark atheistic materialistic positions are essentially running away from that possibility, the possibility that um, there's some fundamental and inexorable reality to the negative uh, experiences, the negative qualia, um, live in complete horror for all eternity and never get out of it. That is simply <laughs> too ghastly a thing to uh, contemplate. So you just say, well, when I die, I'm gone. I don't exist anymore. Phew, I've escaped that. That's the ultimate harm, isn't it? Um, well, okay, I accept that. I accept the fact that that may be some sort of... I won't say permanent, but uh, I would say it is a real condition. Um, being uh, fundamentally depressed, or in the, uh, in the case of anxiety, or terror being fundamentally terrified. Yes, I understand that. But the other side of the coin is equally true. Being fundamentally sublime. Being fundamentally um, in awe. Being fundamentally overwhelmed by everything. Um, H.P. Lovecraft wrote about uh, how horrible life, the universe, and everything can get, but he also wrote The Dream Quest of Unknown Karath, uh, where he's essentially trying to find Shangri-La. And uh, he, in, in the most negative writings that he has, he expresses how horrible things can get, but he also writes things where he says, well, things get beyond horrible at a certain point, and that this quest for the, the fabulous uh, ultimate uh, goodness, or I shouldn't even say goodness, but awe of everything is something that is equally real to the horror. I feel that way, again, when I'm lost in reverie of poetry. Um, when I walk to work, it takes me about an hour to get to work sometimes. Oftentimes, I'm repeating poetry in my head. Well, I'm, I'm an Irishman, so there you go. It, uh, poetry, I guess, works on us. Um, other things, a uh, particularly beautiful piece of architecture. Um, there's this dumb old bank that uh, I don't even think it's being used for anything other than a government building. That's usually what happens in Canada here. When we have a disused building, the government will move in and turn it into something or other until somebody else wants to buy it, and then they leave. Uh, it's a lovely old building with pillars and everything. Uh, it looks like an ancient Greek temple. That never ceases to sort of, wow, as I walk by when I see this thing. Um, the uh, legislature near where I am is another gorgeous old neoclassical building, and it has that effect on me. Whether you know, it, it, it just does. Now somebody else might look at that and say, "Whatever, doesn't mean a thing to me." Okay, um, but what elicits this feeling of the numinous, this feeling of awe, 
is different from person to person. And as I say in the case of, say, drugs or uh, any number of other things, um, uh, abandonment to the uh, complete self-abandonment and abandonment of self-discipline in the search for this sort of awe can have terrible results. Uh, falling hopelessly in love with uh, the wrong person can ha have you crash to earth in a flaming wreck. Um, snorting cocaine can land you in uh, all kinds of terrible uh, uh, positions in your life. But the ultimate aim is, if you ask me, um, an understandable one. You want to feel this awe. You want to feel this fundamental uh, being overwhelmed by positive vibes. Um, you want to feel, I guess, a lot of people have called it samadhi. A lot of people, a lot of dancers say when they're in a, in a ecstatic dance, they're transported, they say, uh, by the fact of dancing. It's just um, more than they can describe, and, and, and a lot of people simply don't even bother to attempt to describe it. This is my attempt to do it, but I don't think that any, I, I don't really have much confidence, and it doesn't really matter if anyone really gets it. Um, but this is what I do believe. Now, I can't imagine sort of a worse experience than deliberately subverting this feeling, saying this doesn't exist. However, I understand it. Again, I, because I understand how negative experience can get, I understand why someone would say that experience itself is horrible, um, that we don't want experience to exist. Therefore, we just say, we will, we will just blot out this thing called experience. Uh, because the ultimate fear I think that a lot of people have is, again, that the negative experiences will simply take over and stay in charge forever. That's an irrational fear, but it's an understandable one. I think all fears are ultimately irrational, but then again, so are all uh, sense, senses of the numinous. So, how do you deal with the numinous in your life? How do you deal with um, that which is overwhelming? That's a fundamental question. And I can't escape the feeling, and this is nothing more than a feeling, that the numinous is, uh, the numinous certainly has value. Awe has value. Feeling your skin tingle as this feeling sweeps over you has value. Um, but it's just an experience, and some experiences are malign and some are benign. Some are good, some are bad. Uh, so I think that experience, in and of itself, is that which makes existence worth it. Um, and I do believe that we have more control over it than we think that we do. But, as I say, it exists. And if you can learn to, I won't say manipulate or control your experiences, but if it, it is something that I think is a valid and certainly a laudable quest in life, to manipulate one's experiences to the point where one is more capable of experiencing awe than in experiencing horror. You're more capable of experiencing joy flooding through you than you are of feeling futility flooding through you. It's an endless inner struggle, I guess, um, but I think that my evidence points to the fact that I'm, or what looks like the fact, that I'm getting better at heading towards the, the awe side, heading towards the numinous side, heading towards the um, joy, bliss, etc. flooding over me. It's an intuitive thing, but that's what I believe. Because I, again, I don't, I can't really trust um, what's going on outside of me. Because again, I have the same tools to judge it as I have any other experience. That's what I believe. Um, I don't think that it's something that one can adequately explain to anyone else. So I don't even attempt to do it. Um, it has a lot to do with my uh, nickname, Anikantavad. Um, and it's also another reason why I never talk about Anikantavada. Uh, I don't really think that one can really explain that point of view adequately. Uh, it seems pointless to even try. You either feel that way or you don't. It's a tool that is gigantic in its implications. But that's what 
I'm... That's my thrust when I'm sort of questioning everything. When you question everything, what have you got left? You've got your own experiences. Are we in control of our experiences, or do they control us? I think on that one, all we can do is take sides. Thank you.